Choir, please. Good morning and welcome to the New York City hearing on housing and building. Please silent all electronic devices at this time. Please, also at no time, please do not approach the dais. If you have any questions, please raise your hand and one of us, the Sergeant at Arms, will kindly assist you. Thank you very much for your kind cooperation. Chair, we're ready to begin. Good morning and thank you, Sergeant. I am Councilmember Pierina Sanchez, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. Thank you for joining us today for our hearing on Intro 429. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Uh, Bronx, we, we try to, we, we tend to want to be louder. Okay, thank you for joining us today for our, hear on intro, our hearing on Intro 429 by me and Intro 925 by Councilmember Lewis. I would like to thank all of my colleagues who are present today, Councilmember Lewis and others who will join. In December 2016, an unspeakable tragedy occurred when a radiator steam leak claimed the lives of two sisters in the Bronx, one-year-old Skyly Vallo Ambrose and two-year-old Ibanez Ambrose. At the time, the tragedy was described as a freak accident that was a result of a series of coincidences. There was not much done to prevent such a tragedy from repeating, and now another family who will be joining us today bears the pain that resulted from this inaction. On the morning of January 19th of this year, 2024, 11-month-old Benjamin, Benjamin Zachariah was sleeping in his family's apartment in Brooklyn when suddenly steam erupted from a nearby radiator. He was found unconscious and pronounced dead after many efforts to revive him. Alarmingly, the Department of Housing Preservation and Development had conducted an inspection of the steam radiator in December of 2022, but found that there were no violations that was warranted despite visible decay in the form of peeling and flaking paint in the radiator. No parent should ever have to fear that when they lay their child to sleep, something like this could happen to them. It is essential that the City Council continues to fight for the right of all New Yorkers to have a safe and dignified place to call home. To that end, today we are hearing Intro 925, sponsored by Councilmember Farrah Lewis, in relation to requiring inspection of steam radiators in multiple dwellings. As we strive to green our city to meet environmental goals, this is also an important question that exists. How safe are the systems that we trust to keep us warm in winter, keep food on our table, through our stoves, and to deliver our water? Additionally, to ensure that all plumbing work is conducted to the highest of standards, we will be hearing intro number 429, sponsored by me, in relation to periodic inspection of gas piping systems, ordinary plumbing work, reestablishing the plumbing and fire suppression piping contractor license board, piping systems, emergency work, fire suppression piping work, and seizures. In 2016, the city council, previous city council, passed 10 gas safety bills and there has been ongoing advocacy around additional modifications needed to local law 152. I wanna thank the master plumbers council, uh, local one, the plumbers from local one, and the plumbing foundation for your ongoing advocacy around intro 429. I would also like to thank my Chief of Staff, Sam Cardenas, my Director of Policy, Land Use and Budget, Ben, ben Ratner, and the Housing and Buildings Committee staff, Taylor Zeleny, Austin Maloney, Jose Conde, Andrew Bourne, Dan Krupp, and Riz Hirota for your work on, this, on today's hearing. I will now turn it over to Councilmember Farah Lewis to say a few words about her bill. Thank you, Chair Sanchez, for your support and for holding this hearing today to work towards safeguarding our homes against preventable dangers within them. I also want to thank Alex and Bessie Kurvoski from Midwood in my district for joining us today to testify. I know how difficult reliving this tragedy is for you both, and I appreciate your dedication to advocating for change in our city laws. On behalf of your son, on the morning of January 19th of this year, these two parents experienced the unimaginable loss of their 11th month old son, Benjamin Zachariah who was found unconscious after being burned alive in a room filled with steam from a faulty radiator in their apartment. Despite all efforts to save him, Benjamin was tragically pronounced dead due to, this, due to the steam inhalation and thermal burns. As we know, this incident is not isolated, echoing a similar heartbreaking event from seven years ago in the Bronx, where two toddlers lost their lives due to scaffolding heat from a defective radiator. These repeated tragedies are not just isolated incidents. They reflect a broader issue within our city's aging housing stock that demands immediate attention. 
We must act now to ensure that no more innocent lives are lost due to such preventable circumstances. My bill, Intro 925, mandates the owners of multiple dwellings to conduct annual inspections of all steam radiators in their units and common areas and require potential defects and damages to be assessed within seven days by a professional. These measures are imperative to provide for the safety of tenants, residents, families, and impose penalties and neglect on neglectful na landlords who fail to address any identified issues. All families deserve to live in a safe and secure environment, and it is our responsibility as legislators to enforce standards that protect the most vulnerable among us. The, bill, the passage of this bill would be a crucial step towards ensuring that no family in our city has to endure the pain and loss that the Kowalski family and others have suffered. I urge my colleagues to support intro 925, which is now called Ben Z's Law. Thank you, Speaker Adams, for that. To honor the memory of Benjamin Zachariah and ensure we protect all families from such affordable and heartbreaking tragedies. I also wanna thank Chair Sanchez for her leadership and support to ensure that this bill moved forward. And I wanna thank the STEAM fitters for their support as well for working through this bill with us. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Lewis. I'd now like to turn it over to Committee Council to administer the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you firm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer all council member questions honestly? Thanks, you may begin. Good morning, Chair Sanchez, uh, Council Member Lewis, and members of the Housing and Buildings Committee. My name is Anne Marie Santiago, and I am the Deputy Commissioner of the Office of Enforcement and Neighborhood Services at the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about Intro 925, which seeks to amend the Administrative Code of the City of New York in relation to requiring the inspection of steam radiators in multiple dwellings. We are here today talking about this bill because of the events of January 2024, in which an 11-month-old boy died after suffering severe burns from a malfunctioning steam radiator. This tragedy highlights the importance of understanding how we can protect our children from the dangers that many of us don't think of often, those within our homes. And HPD is committed to working with the City Council to explore strategies to prevent such tragedies in the future. HPD's primary enforcement goal each and every day is to ensure that tenants live in safe housing that complies with New York City and New York State housing codes. Our housing inspectors respond to hundreds of thousands of complaints inspecting for health and safety issues, including potentially life-threatening conditions, such as a lack of heat or electricity. On every inspection, a housing inspector proactively checks for 10 health and safety issues, which, left unaddressed, can expose tenants, particularly children, to serious risk of death or injury, including missing or improperly installed window guards, non-functioning or missing self-closing doors, and missing or defective smoke detectors. We dedicate resources to housing court actions both with and on behalf of tenants, emergency repairs where landlords fail to fulfill their responsibilities to correct the most immediately hazardous conditions, and landlord and tenant education. We invest heavily in enhanced enforcement against, buildings whose, uh, against landlords whose buildings grossly fail to meet the standards our city has set for safe and healthy housing. As part of our inspection work, HPD responds to complaints regarding defective radiators. In fiscal year 2024, HPD received almost 6,400 complaints regarding radiators in several categories, including air valve broken or missing, radiator loose, disconnected or missing, radiator cracked or leaking, and shut off valve broken. Either in response to these complaints or as observed in their line of travel, Inspectors issued more than 1,600 violations related to radiators during that time. Approximately 450 of those violations were considered to be immediately hazardous and received follow-up from our emergency repair program. We strongly encourage any tenant experiencing issues with their radiator, whether the radiator is leaking or there is steam escaping, to report the condition to the landlord first, and then, if the owner is unresponsive, to file a complaint with HPD by calling 311 or using 311 online to file an apartment maintenance complaint. Intro 925 requires property owners to inspect, make repairs, and report on radiator inspections and repairs. 
Under the proposed bill, property owners of buildings with steam radiator systems would be required to identify whether a child under six resides in the apartment, have an annual inspection of steam radiators performed by a licensed master plumber in dwelling units where a child under six resides, and file a report with the department annually regarding the results of these inspections. A civil penalty will be established for owners who fail to file. Obtaining civil penalties requires HPD to go to housing court to obtain the penalty. Should a licensed master plumber find a problem either as a result of the inspection or in response to any complaint made to the owner or to HPD throughout the year, immediate repairs would be required and the department would have to be notified. Failure to have inspections conducted or to remediate damage, defects, or hazardous conditions would also be subject to a civil penalty obtainable through housing court action. These requirements would likely affect more than 100,000 buildings citywide. Implementing this bill would be time and resource intensive for HPD. The agency will have to establish a public portal and manual process for the submission of annual reports and reports of defects related to steam radiators. Under the best case scenario, creating such a portal and process takes multiple years to implement. We must identify and contract with a vendor to build a portal with specific administrative functionality necessary to support our enforcement process. The functionalities of the system must include accepting and processing reports to ensure proper submission, including rejecting reports that are not complete, as well as interfacing with our existing technology to generate track and close violations. In addition to new technology specific to this mandate, new staff will be required to manage the process and perform duties such as handling inquiries, doing data entry related to manual submissions, addressing ongoing technology issues, conducting document review, monitoring violation issuance and closure, and potentially initiating litigation to obtain civil penalties if significant issues of noncompliance are identified. We must also recognize the administrative and cost burden this will place on tens of thousands of property owners, especially owners of older properties. Some of these property owners are already struggling to meet the expenses associated with existing mandates, and HPD continues to seek ways to provide assistance to address aging building systems and move towards greener infrastructure to improve overall building health, uh, building and tenant health. Given that HPD already has the tools in place to respond to radiator conditions, we do not support Intro 925. Recognizing that defective steam radiators can be a serious hazard, however, we do encourage all tenants and property owners to identify defects when they arise and correct the conditions immediately. HPD stands ready to respond to the most serious complaints and has the ability to issue Class C violations, which require a 24-hour response from landlords for immediately hazardous radiator conditions. We believe that focusing on working with the Department of Buildings and industry professionals to ensure that tenants and owners have the information they need to identify, report, and have professionals properly repair defective radiators may help prevent tragedies related to steam heat in the future. We are interested in continuing conversations with the Council about alternative strategies, such as enhanced education, for which there are multiple possible existing pathways that can be replicated. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Buildings, do you have copies of your testimony? I believe we do. You may proceed. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Sanchez and members of the Housing and Buildings Committee. I am Gus Arrakis, Deputy Commissioner for Development and Technical Affairs for the New York City Department of Buildings. I am joined today by Tara Khalil, Assistant Commissioner for Central Inspections. We appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today regarding Intro 429, which makes several amendments to the New York City Construction Codes. The Department's code revision process represents a true collaborative effort on the part of the industry, the New York City Council, and the code development team at the Department. The most recent version of the Construction Codes, the 2022 Construction Codes, went into effect on November 7, 2022. Revising the construction codes involved a public-private partnership that included over 650 industry professionals and stakeholders who volunteered their time to contribute their expertise. This code revision effort resulted in over 40,000 hours of service by our committee members, which included architects, engineers, attorneys, as well as representatives of construction, labor, real estate, and other city agencies and other stakeholder organizations. Work is already underway to revise the construction codes again, 
and to create a first ever New York City existing building code, or the EBC, which will establish a robust regulatory framework for the alteration and maintenance of existing buildings. The department has several concerns with intro 429 as it would undo positive changes made by and efficiencies achieved through the 2022 construction codes. Further, we believe that as drafted, certain provisions could create confusion rather than provide clarity. Our concerns are as follows. Uh, emergency work, section uh, administrative code 28105.4.1. Understanding that emergency situations may arise that require immediate action to resolve, the current code allows for emergency work to be performed prior to obtaining a permit to address a hazard to prevent harm to persons or property. An application for a permit must be filed with the department within two business days of commencing the emergency work. The bill seeks to incorporate language into the introductory paragraph of that section that would allow work necessary to restore the system to a good working condition to be performed prior to obtaining a permit. It is unclear what issue the proposed text restore the system to good working condition is intended to address. It is the department's position that the proposed language is too broad, ambiguous, and goes well beyond the scope of what's contemplated with respect to emergency work. The provision is intended to allow only for the work that is necessary to abate the emergency. Any additional work beyond that must be performed under a limited alteration application, which means any required permits must be obtained prior to commencement of the work. With respect to the proposed amendments to item four, it is the department's position that the current limitation to educational and residential buildings is appropriate. The intent is to allow for emergency work necessary to ensure that heat and hot water is provided to buildings in those occupancy groups during what is referred to in New York City as heating season. The proposed amendments seek to expand that allowance beyond those occupancy groups. The proposed deletion of the phrase servicing educational residential occupancies effectively expands allowance to all occupancy groups. Such expansion, coupled with other proposed edits, would significantly expand the allowance beyond what was originally intended. The department believes that such a change could pose potential safety concerns. Ordinary plumbing work, admin code section 28105.4.4. Conceptually, the department is not opposed to the proposed amendments related to ordinary plumbing work. However, it does not believe that this is the best way to address the issue. The department has been working on developing the EBC, the existing building code, which it anticipates finalizing for submission to the New York City Council by the end of this year. Consistent with the department's other code revision and development efforts, there was a committee process that allowed for input by industry stakeholder groups and subject matter experts. The proposed amendments to the provisions pertaining to ordinary plumbing work are included in the draft EBC. The department believes this proposal is more appropriately covered in the EBC which will be a comprehensive code that regulates alterations and work in existing buildings. If these changes are adopted and incorporated into current administrative provisions, legislation will be needed to relocate the provisions to the EBC where they should reside. Therefore, the department is opposed to this proposal as it addresses the issue in a piecemeal rather than comprehensive approach. Periodic inspection of gas piping systems, admin code section 28318. The bill proposes several changes to the requirements for the periodic inspection of gas piping systems, which will, I will address at a high level. Admin code section 28-318.1. The current law exempts covered buildings with no gas piping in covered buildings that aren't currently supplied with gas from the inspection requirements. There are already provisions in the law for informing the department of such, and those have been successfully implemented. The proposed amendments as drafted would require the owner to hire a licensed master plumber or registered design professional to conduct an inspection to inform the department that the building has no gas piping or is not currently supplied with gas, which is contrary to what was intended by the existing exceptions to the inspection requirements. Admin code section 28318.2. The current code already allows for modification of the inspection frequency by rule. The department has promulgated and implemented a rule 1 RCNY 103-10, related to the periodic inspection of gas piping systems. The department has the ability, pursuant to the New York City Administrative Procedure Act, to amend the rule. Therefore, the proposed change is unnecessary and would have no meaningful impact. Admin Code Section 28318.3.1.
it is unclear what the issue the proposed changes to the inspection entity qualification requirements are intended to address. As mentioned earlier, the department promulgated rule 1RCNY 103-10, setting forth certain inspection and other requirements. That included the minimum qualification requirements for the inspection entity. Inspectors must be a licensed master plumber or an, an individual working under the direct and continuing supervision of a licensed master plumber, provided that such individual has five years of experience and has completed a related training program. The proposed amendment includes language requiring those working under the direct and continuing supervision of a licensed master plumber to also hold a journeyman plumber registration, which would significantly limit the pool of individuals who are qualified to perform these inspections. The department believes the existing code and rule provisions are sufficient to address the qualifications for entities conducting the inspections. Additionally, mandating proof of inspector qualifications on each report and certification submitted to building owners and the department reflecting that the required inspection has occurred is unnecessary. The licensed master plumber is ultimately responsible for work performed by those working under their direct and continuing supervision, including verifying that they possess the appropriate qualifications. The department believes including the proposed language could muddy the waters with respect to the line of responsibility. Admin code section 28-318.3.2. The proposed changes to the scope of the inspection are significant and may pose an undue burden on building owners as the current inspection requirement does not include tenant spaces. This includes logistical challenges since access to tenant spaces would now be required. Additionally, expanding the scope may directly correlate to increased inspection costs for building owners. We encourage you to discuss these changes further with building owners to better understand what impact they may have on their requirement to perform these inspections. Admin Code Section 2018-318.3.4. Uh, the proposed changes to this section include deletion of the list of unsafe or hazardous conditions where notification to the owner, utility, and the department is required. The department believes the deletion of this list is a step backwards. Providing a definitive list of when notification is triggered is useful to all parties. It provides clear direction and avoids the potential for confusion and uncertainty. Admin Code Section 28-318.3.4.1. The bill proposes to add a new section related to reporting and correction of abnormal operating conditions that don't pose an immediate hazard and requirements for correcting abnormal conditions related to service piping. The requirements that pertain to service piping are beyond the intended scope of Local Law 152 of 2016. Service piping is under the jurisdiction of the Public Service Commission, not the Department. This proposed new section also adds a provision that would require the department to be notified in connection with any abnormal operating condition that does not present an immediate hazard discovered during the inspection. The current code requires notification to the owner, utility, and the department when an unsafe or hazardous condition is identified. Requiring notification to the department in connection with any abnormal operating condition that does not present an immediate hazard would be unduly burdensome. In addition, requiring the department to promulgate a rule dictating what corrective measures should be undertaken to address an abnormal condition is impractical as this should appropriately be left to the qualified individuals performing the inspections. The determination as to the appropriate course of action to remediate an abnormal condition is done on a case-by-case -case basis by the inspection entity based on their assessment of the condition. The proposed provision would potentially shift responsibility from the inspection entity to the department which would be inappropriate. The definition of fire suppression piping work, admin code section 28-401.3. During the 2022 construction code revision project, industry stakeholder groups sought clarification regarding what constitutes plumbing work and what constitutes fire suppression piping work. Changes were made to provide the clarification, including the addition of the sentence now proposed for deletion. The department believes the deletion of the sentence would create confusion confusion rather than provide clarity. Certain sprinkler work may be performed by either a licensed master plumber or a master fire suppression piping contractor. However, only a licensed master plumber can perform the related work on the domestic water piping. If supplied by domestic water, only a licensed master plumber can perform the initial takeoff. Therefore, fire suppression work should not include plumbing work. The sentence that is proposed to be deleted must be retained in order to maintain that distinction and separation between the discrete scopes of work and experience. 
Plumbing and Fire Suppression Piping Contractor License Board, Article 417 of the Admin Code. Many of the changes enacted by the 2022 construction codes, one of the many changes enacted by the 2022 construction codes was the elimination of the Plumbing and Fire Suppression Piping Contractor Board. As the regulatory entity, the department is in the best position to determine license qualification. Elimination of the board has streamlined the license application process. When the board was in existence, meetings were held quarterly and applications had to be reviewed by a quorum of board members. Coordination of multiple board member schedules resulted in delays in the review of license applications. Since the board was eliminated, processing times for plumber and fire suppression pipe contractor licenses has significantly de decreased as there is not a dependence on a quarterly board meeting. That is a benefit to applicants seeking licensure. It's worth noting that only one other trade licensed by the department has a board, and that is the electricians. As part of the current electrical code revision, that board is similarly being eliminated. The goal is for licensing process for all trades to be managed consistently and avoid disparity. Seizure and forfeiture, admin code section 2814.419.1. Uh, this proposal is being reviewed during the current construction code revision cycle. The department believes that the code committee process is the appropriate mechanism for tackling this issue as it provides for a comprehensive evaluation process. Moreover, this proposal may necessitate changes elsewhere in the construction codes to achieve the intended goal. It is our position that it is best addressed through code revision rather than a standalone item in this bill. Piping systems, fuel gas code section 101.2.2. As drafted, the proposed language amending the fuel gas code could be interpreted to impose an obligation on the department to perform inspections for scopes of work, such as the replacement of stoves. We're concerned that this would strain our inspectorial resources. It would be helpful to understand the intended goal of the proposed change. To the extent a change to the provision is warranted, the department strongly recommends that it be evaluated through the code revision committee process as all possible impacts need to be considered. That concludes the department's testimony regarding intro 429. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify before you today. We welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, uh, HPD and DOB. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we were joined by Councilmember Hudson and Ressler. Uh, we have Councilmember Caban on Zoom and Councilmember Abreu is here with us. And I'd also like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Alex and Bessie Karaski. Thank you so much for your advocacy and for being here today. So I'm going to start with questions for HPD, and then I'm going to move to questions uh, for DOB. Um, great. Questions uh, to, to DOB. And then uh, after, if my colleagues have questions, they, they will ask, and with them we'll move over to public testimony. So my, my first questions, my first series of questions, Deputy Commissioner, are just going to be in connection to your testimony. So you, you explained that HPD received almost 6,400 complaints regarding radiators in several categories, including air valve uh, that was broken or missing, a radiator that was loose, disconnected or missing, radiator that was cracked or leaking, the shutoff valve was broken, and that 1,600 violations related to radiators were issued during this time in fiscal year 24. 450 of those were considered to be immediately hazardous and received follow-up from the ERP team. So can you, can you just uh, help us understand the 450 violations that were considered to be immediately hazardous, what, what kind of uh, violations are we talking about and how should the, a regular New Yorker who's looking at their radiator understand that they, may be, they might be at risk? Yes, thank you, Council Member. So uh, when an inspector uh, sees a radiator, um, it's primarily violations regarding either the air valves uh, or steam that are um, emergency repair generating violations. And as you know, through the emergency repair process, we follow up with phone calls to the property owner, to the tenant. We go out and we attempt to take a look at the condition and if necessary, hire a contractor to do some repair work. Um, most of our emergency repair conditions across the board are corrected by property owners and owners are required to fix those in the case of, of radiators within 24 hours of notice. What is, the risk? what is the risk of an air valve malfunction or 
broken uh, with an evasive I think exactly uh, what was the case here, council member, is you know, we don't see it often, um, but there is a, a risk of the steam escaping such that someone could be injured. So you mentioned that these requirements could affect uh, more than 100,000 buildings citywide. Do, my understanding is that we do not have good information about how many buildings in the city of New York are using uh, steam radiator systems. Do we have that estimate? Uh, no, that's correct. Um, we don't have an idea of, of the exact buildings that have these systems, um, but in consultation with the Department of Buildings, it is my understanding that most older properties do. Obviously, that was the, the system in use at that time. Um, I know we are looking to try and ha help buildings convert over to other types of heating systems moving forward, and I think we want to focus our efforts on allowing property owners to focus on that conversion. And so how did you arrive at, a, at the estimate of 100,000 buildings citywide? So we looked at um, just the number of properties that we have. So we have approximately, I would say, about 160,000 um, uh, multiple dwellings in the city, maybe a little bit more. Um, and so we would consider that a fair amount of those still have steam systems. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can you can you describe? Um, well, you you expressed some concerns around um, HPD's administration of a new requirement like this, um, namely that you would have to uh, contract with a vendor, build a new portal, um, you would have to hire staff to to process the information that HPD is receiving. Can you help us understand um, in the, the correlate, right, the, the way that HPD receives lead inspection information? Um, what, what, what does that system look like today? Thank you. So lead inspection information is not required to be submitted proactively to HPD. However, there is a, a bed bug requirement where a document is required to be submitted for all properties to HPD every year, uh, explaining did the inspector, did, I'm sorry, did the property owner do find bed bugs during the year? Did they take remediated action to do that? That is a process that affects all multiple dwellings and they are required to file. It is an online process for most properties, um, but smaller properties owned by individual or uh, joint owners, we allow to file with paper and it is a very um, intensive process for both our staff and for property owners to go online, fill out the form. Um, we do issue significant number of violations for people who just fail to file. Um, and so there is a lot of administrative overhead involved with that process. Um, can you quantify how many safety incidents related to the 450 immediately hazardous va violations have there been? Does, does HPD track that kind of information, health? No, council member, I'm sorry, we don't. What has the department done differently since the 2016 tragedy and since Benjamin's uh, tragedy? Um, thank you, council members. So um, the 2016 tragedy, as you know, and as I think you stated, um, didn't really seem to be a larger issue at that time. Um, the department continued to do what it does, which is in, in, in response to both tragedies, actually, at the time of the incident, remind uh, tenants, owners about their responsibility, owners about their responsibilities to maintain these systems, but tenants about their ability to call in and file complaints with us if an owner doesn't make a repair. And so again, I think, you know, that would be a primary strategy for us in educating tenants and owners about how to uh, identify when issues arise, how to address those issues, and that HPD or New York City will respond if they have an issue. How many, how many complaints did HPD receive citywide in fiscal 24? Over 800,000 complaints. 800,000, so 6,400 6, regarding radiators out of 800,000. Very 0.5% perhaps. Um, is, it, is it your uh, perspective that 6,400 complaints regarding radiators is reflective of what, what the city is facing in terms of defective radiators citywide? I, I couldn't say, Council Member. Uh, I would imagine that 
uh, people who have sometimes leaky radiators or have concerns don't call. And that is really where, you know, it would be important for us to continue with that education for people to know that that is not the normal functioning of the device and that they should be reporting it. Again, first to their property owner and then to uh, the agency if it's not addressed. Do you have, um, for, for the particular apartment uh, where Benjamin lived and there was a December 2022 inspection, why did HPD look at the radiator? Was that complaint driven? Um, HPD received a complaint about peeling paint on the radiator. Um, and actually we were attempting to do a lead-based paint inspection because that kind of report, that kind of condition would have necessitated, because there was a child under six in the apartment, a lead inspection. Um, we did attempt to do that inspection and we were advised uh, that the owner was addressing the condition. Did HPD go back and check for compliance? We did not, council member. Um, no violations were issued. I'm sorry? No violations were issued at that time because we were advised that the work was going on. Um, the complaint was canceled when a tenant tells us that the repair work is ongoing. And did that owner certify the correction to the agency? Again, council member, the no violation was issued, so there was nothing to certify. And so, Today, concerns around radiators are entirely complaint driven. There's no proactive action. There's, there's no line of sight uh, requirement for Absolutely. HPD inspectors. The, I, I would say that there are two conditions under which we would look at radiators as part of our regular inspection, council members. So again, in connection with lead-based paint, which are uh, conducted in apartments with children under six, we are looking at all painted surfaces. And in my experience, most radiators have been painted and so they get a review by the inspector who's doing that inspection, um, and that includes all rooms in the apartment. Um, a second condition under which we would look at a radiator is on a heat inspection. If no heat was being provided, we would generally, or inadequate heat, uh, we would generally at least review in the coldest room, which is where we take our temperatures, um, uh, the condition of the radiator. What are other safety measures that could be used to prevent an individual from being injured by a faulty steam radiator? Um, I'm not an expert in this area. Uh, uh, what I have read um, includes using radiator covers, uh, if, if that is an option, depending on the radiator style. Um, certainly, again, the, your best option is to let your landlord know that there is a condition and then to contact 311 if that condition is not remediated. What are the qualifications of HPD inspectors that look at radiators? HPD inspectors, all HPD inspectors can look at radiators and they're all, every inspector's general background is construction. Whether that's plumbing or electrical or general construction. But they're not licensed master plumbers or no council members, they are not. Would requiring that steam radiator inspections be conducted by licensed master plumbers uh, present any challenges to the city? Uh, that requirement is on the property owner. Um, however, in uh, what I would consider to be a very similar scenario for lead-based paint, the first inspection, the initial inspection of the apartment is a visual inspection that can be done by the property owner or someone under the property owner's um, uh, employ. Um, once a visual inspection results in a finding that there is peeling paint in that case, that's when you call in a professional uh, person to come and make a more detailed assessment. And I'm sorry, what are the, the, pers the person who comes next to make the more detailed assessment, what should their qualifications be? For lead-based paint, they need to be an EPA certified uh, inspector. What about in relationship to radiators? Uh, as far as I know, and, and I will defer to my colleagues, I don't believe that there is this similar situation where there's a requirement for visual inspection and then anything happens. I'm not exactly, uh, uh, I don't know how property owners usually um, address this issue. Um, 
Seems like we don't, yeah, we're, we're pretty lax uh, in thinking about radiators in the city. Intro 925 requires that owners of covered multiple dwellings notify tenants of the owner's obligation to inspect steam radiators and dwelling units where a child under the age of six resides. How would, how would HPD enforce such a requirement? Thank you, council member. I think that this is exactly where um, one of our alternative thoughts about how to educate would be helpful. Um, so for, uh, again, kind of looking at an existing process for gas leaks, um, property owners are required to post a notice in a common area that provides the tenant with information on how to respond, what to do if they suspect a gas leak, um, and that is enforceable by HPD because we can check for the posting. It's a very easy and public way in a public area that we know that a uh, requirement has been met. And I think that that may be a, a, a better way for the tenants and for us to ensure that um, that information is provided. Okay. Um, if, an, if an inspection were to determine that a steam radiator is likely to be hazardous to life or safety, the owners under this bill would need to take the steam radiator out of service w within 24 hours and rep repair or replace it within seven days of the inspection. Is this feasible? I would defer to my DOB colleagues. Uh, I think it's going to depend on the nature of the, the defects that are identified, if uh, work permits are necessary to, to make the repair. So it's, it's kind of a, a guessing game from that standpoint. But obtaining a licensed plumber during heating season can be a challenge as well from that standpoint. Tarek? And yeah, I mean, I think that's it well said. Um, also, in terms of uh, folks who can also do this kind of work, you have folks who do, for example, boiler inspections, right? Oil burner equipment installers. These folks can also help out with situations. I'm sorry, can you get a little closer to the mic? Yeah, sure. Oil burner equipment, oil burning equipment installers, very long uh, name, but those are folks who can also um, do this kind of work. Um, you also have stationary engineers as well. But a valve change, valves are ten, fifteen dollars, right? And they can be unscrewed and put in the new one. Right. So yeah, you, have different, yeah, you have different types, right? You have um, thermostatic valves, etc. Different types of valves, and they would require obviously shutting down the system, making sure the system cools down, right? Um, and then you disconnect, you know, whatever you need to disconnect in terms of radiators, right? And then, of course, you need to make sure there's no air in the system when you turn the system back on, et cetera. So you need somebody who's qualified, who knows what they're doing when it comes to steam radiators. So, so the repair work today for, for issues within a radiator, if an air valve is broken or the radiator is loose um, or cracked or leaking or the shutoff valve is broken, does the city have requirements today for how those repairs are made? Um, so an air valve, a radiator in general, that's part of a distribution system side of it, right? So um, in terms of addressing those kind of repairs, the there's no specific procedure, right, to, to replacing it. It's not, it's not outlined, but you would have a, um, like most of the professionals who do work on this kind of stuff, like if you talk to, for example, a high pressure boiler operating engineer, they know what needs to be done to take this radiator, radiator, replace it, and also start the system up again correctly. Same thing for a master plumber, same thing for a oil burning equipment installer as well. Those are three trades that certainly know what they're doing when it comes to steam radiators. And I think many, again, not to speak on behalf of owners, but I think that many uh, property owners have uh, uh, staff um, who can handle a lot of this work, uh, who are on staff, um, you know, who are familiar with these types of systems and doing the minor repairs that you're mentioning um, are capable of doing so. I think, you know, in terms of real system issues, that's a, that's a different question. 
um, certainly, and I think we would uh, we would want a licensed qualified person doing that, but I think the, the more minor repairs, the more general repairs that you're referencing, you know, a good building superintendent um, will probably know how to address those issues. I had a broken air valve in my home and I tried to change it and I did not do it right. So uh, it's, it's scary, it's scary. I, and then I left it off because I, it was still leaking um, and I still don't have heat. But you know, for, for tenants who are, are living in a home, I think there's, there's just concern. I, I have concern for, for New Yorkers who are in their homes and they don't know whether their supers are qualified and do know, right? There, there are some basic things, but I think there's a, there's a gap here certainly with how, uh, you know, how deep our processes are with code revisions that for inside the home where a radiator is and where, where an issue can happen and, and has happened in, in the case of these two horrible tragedies, we don't have procedures, we don't have protocols, we only have protocols outside of the, of the home. So I think that's, that's worth talking more about in addition to your recommendation about, um, about education for New Yorkers. Um, okay, so turning, turning to 529 now, 429. Did you know there was another bill? No, I'm kidding. Um, turning to 429. So 429, as, as we've been discussing, um, is in relation to periodic inspection of gas piping systems and the, the administration, Department of Buildings, laid out a number of concerns. Um, and I look forward to uh, industry professionals who are here responding to some of those uh, later in their own testimony. Um, but I'm just gonna start with a, a couple of clarifying questions, uh, Deputy Commissioner, from your testimony. So starting with emergency work, AC section 28-105.4.1, you mentioned that expanding, um, let me say this correctly, Yeah, that such an expansion coupled with other proposed edits would significantly expand the uh, allowance beyond what was originally intended and this could pose potential safety concerns. Can you, can you explain why there would be safety concerns with ex this expansion? Uh, so restoring the system to good working condition, I think in and of itself is uh, it doesn't describe an emergency. It describes something that's just not working, uh, but not necessarily the scenario of why a permit can't be obtained, the proper steps to go through the inspection process uh, and sign-off process can't be followed prior to beginning the work. Uh, combine that maybe with the expansion of uh, removal of the phrase for equipment servicing education or residential occupancies, you now have a scenario where any commercial establishment that has equipment that's not in good working order uh, could begin performing work on their system that would otherwise require a permit without having any filings on, uh, on record with the Department of Buildings and then uh, we have to play catch up afterwards from that same point. And there's no reason why the, the filings can't, can't occur. We have uh, multiple, uh, also to address maybe part of the, the, some of the steam issues that some of the work might be ordinary repairs that can be performed directly by a licensed trade person without the need of a permit. Uh, but then as you start getting into uh, more serious work, a permit is needed, but some of it can be performed by the licensed trade person with what's called a limited alteration application. The trades person can apply for that application digitally. 90 some odd percent of those go straight to permit. There's no plan review in advance. It's literally the trades telling us what work that they are doing and putting us on notice that we would need to come out for an inspection and that work is going on. Is, is it um, DOB's interpretation of this change that in, in, in this expansion um, where commercial facilities could, you know, theoretically start work without a, a permit that they would never file the permit? That's a potential misuse there that it could be done and if it's done in the middle of the night with no one to check that, uh, you know, uh, disputes sometimes arise between owners and trades folks that, you know, uh, you didn't pay me enough to go follow through with the permit. I'm not sure where someone would end up there. But the, uh, I also on the, the reverse end, uh, our emergency system, I don't, 
uh, we haven't seen necessarily an issue where people have not been able to undertake emergency work, uh, notifying the department in advance and saying we're, we're in need of, of doing this work immediately. We have the five borough offices, we have central inspection divisions that are available uh, to assist and give guidance as to what can be done with and without a permit uh, in those emergency situations. So I'm not sure that we need an expansion here as of yet. Thank you. Um, next question is regarding periodic inspection of gas piping systems uh, where you highlight in 28-318.1 that there are already provisions in the law for informing the department when you don't have um, gas piping in the building. What are those existing provisions? Um, yes, so. Um, the existing provisions I believe are in the rule in and of itself as well as uh, through our online portal, and Tara correct me here if I'm wrong, but through, through our online portal, uh, property owners, uh, architects, engineers, and uh, boiler, uh, excuse me, plumbers can give us notification that there is no gas service to this building through documentation that's uh, such as utility notices, things of that nature that wouldn't necess necessitate an ins a physical inspection be performed of the building. Is there anything else? Because a, a, a utility bill can tell you that gas isn't in use, but it doesn't tell you that it's not, that there aren't gas pipes present, right? Yeah, so I'll just expand on that. So when it comes to situations where you have no gas piping scenarios, those scenarios could be, for example, a building that went fully electric, for example, right? And in that scenario, the piping from the main, from the street, the main gas piping to the building itself is no longer in service, they may have actually disconnected the piping, uh, service piping to the building itself. And so in that scenario, if you do some coordination with the utility company, for example, they could, for example, verify for you that that service was actually indeed disconnected. And then, uh, then what they would do is they, they would furnish a disconnection letter, just verifying that the service was actually disconnected. So just to kind of give you like a, a practical insight. And who is, who is authorized to provide such a disconnect, or to like author such a disconnection letter? So utilities. utility companies, they, they have that authority. They can give that disconnection letter to the owner. Got it, okay. Um, AC section, I, I love the way that you spelled this out because I can point out exactly where the question is, uh, but AC section 28-318.3.2, um, you talk about access issues in tenant spaces. Can you, are there, um, are there any sort of proactive requirements that the agency has that requires access to, to the tenant uh, unit? Without um, an actual work permit, I can't think of a mandatory inspection where we go inside of a tenant space. Um, the only thing would be access to equipment rooms such as the, the boiler room, uh, elevator, machine rooms, pits, but not the actual tenant spaces. Got it. Thank you. So abnormal operating conditions. Um, can you give us some examples of what abnormal operating conditions might might come up? It sounds like you don't think that they, well, they're, they're not classified as unsafe or hazardous? So abnormal uh, operating conditions, they can be uh, situations, for example, where you have heavily corroded piping, for example. That's, a, that's an example. Um, where the integrity of the piping, for example, is at a level where if you were to just touch it, you, you seriously compromise the, the piping, gas may escape, right? Um, another another uh, type of abnormal operating condition could be, for example, um, a leak, a leak, right? That's another type of situation where you have, um, you know, you have your portable combustible, combustible gas detector. You'll practically go survey the piping 
and you'll see if there's actually any uh, significant leaks or leaks in the piping itself, right? Um, another uh, type of situation could be from a code perspective, right? Let's say, for example, you see piping that it's a long run and that piping is not properly supported. That's dangerous because obviously, I mean, it's, I'm sorry, it's an abnormal condition, right? It's because you can possibly have a situation where the piping could possibly collapse if it's not properly supported. So th those are like a few examples that you have. That sounds pretty dangerous though, if, if a pipe can collapse, no? Well, if it's not properly supported, right. So th that's, I'm, I'm just giving examples, right. Mm -hmm. can I, just to clarify, I understood your question though as abnormal conditions not, that are not immediately hazardous, is that correct? So well, Tarek, maybe there, one. Well, there's, there's two types obviously, right? There's, there's abnormal hazardous and you have abnormal non-hazardous, right? If you were to just think about it practically speaking. So what's an example of an abnormal, abnormal condition that's not immediately hazardous? Oh, that, that would be, for example, you might have some missing piping support, but it may not be hazardous. It may not be immediately hazardous. So that, that could be as an example right there. Thank you. Okay, so you, you re also raised concerns around requiring that around um, being opposed to the requirement that the individuals working under the supervision of the licensed master plumbers are journeymen. Um, can you, would, would a journeyman a plumber be qualified to in conduct, the, um, conduct the inspection on their own without the licensed master plumber? No, I think the, the inspection is required to be performed under the direct and continuing supervision of the, the licensed master plumber, but I think the concern was also limiting it to merely the, to only those registered as journeymen and not just others who work for a licensed master plumber could be severely limiting as to who's available to do this. What are some of, what are some of those uh, titles or uh, individuals that would be excluded by only allowing journeymen? I, I don't know that they have titles, but uh, specifically, but there are uh, there are uh, classes that are required to be taken for performing this inspection uh, because it's it's uh, it's not about actually doing the piping installation and the plumbing installation. It's about identifying the the corrosion, the defects, and other uh, uh, maintenance issues that could could arise as well. So it's its own separate class, but there are others who do plumbing work under a licensed master plumber that don't have the, the journeyman title or any title. I think that's right. Yeah. How many, what are the qualifications of a journeyman plumber? You require at least five years of experience. So I, I think that was kind of like the logic behind this proposal, but it's, you require five years of experience and the rule also and the law requires five experience, five years of experience. And so someone who is sort of walking in off the street but working with a master, uh, master, licensed master plumber is, is good to inspect these sy systems? They, they have to have the years of experience working, working under the master plumber themselves. And then also when they conduct the inspection as well, that work needs to be reviewed by a licensed master plumber as well. The review is required. And how many years of experience are required? The folks working under the licensed master plumber is five years. I thought you said that's the qualification of a journey person. That, yeah, they, they both coincide, right? They're, they're both five years. They're both five, okay. Yeah, yeah. Understood, understood. Okay. Yeah. Th those qualifications are actually published in our rule. Okay, licensing board. Um, I understand that the Department of Buildings through the most recent codes councils are trying to or, or have been removing most licensing boards. Can you share how the plumbing and fire suppression pipe, piping contracting licensing board function when it did exist? So my, my understanding is there were about four staff members that uh, uh, administered this board. Uh, they would get the applications for the members who would be uh, members of the board run them through our uh, uh, board selection process. Then uh, at the same time they would schedule quarterly meetings around a quorum. We needed a quorum of the board so making sure that we had 
sufficient uh, members in attendance. They would also then process the background check applications for the licensing, uh, the new candidates for, for licensure, uh, distribute them to the board members, uh, hold the meeting, collect what, whatever decisions were made at the meeting, and uh, dock it for future meetings, uh, any backlog that occurred. Th these meetings, I believe, were quarterly. Uh, we haven't had the board since 2022, and our understanding is our service levels have gotten much better with review times on uh, our licensing applications. So service times have, have improved. Um, but the board was responsible for advising the commissioner on items such as the character and fitness of licensing applicants, allegations of illegal practices and code revisions. How, how has the department continued to oversee these items in the absence of the board? I think you know we do a, a pretty thorough job on our background checks and making sure that people are presenting us with the appropriate uh, qualifications and work experience. We do quite a thorough job there. Our background check is uh, quite, uh, I think, a serious process that people go through. Uh, and we do take unlicensed work uh, activity quite seriously and uh, issue serious violations for it from that standpoint. And how does, uh, looking at the composition of, of, the, of the board, of the proposed, the reinstate, the board that would be reinstated, um, there are labor uh, representatives, there are industry representatives. How does the Department of Buildings um, engage with these, these members of industry outside of the board or without having a board? Um, with, without having a board, we have regular, um, business meetings, I would say, that with these stakeholder organizations that represent them. We meet uh, frequently with the, uh, plumbing, uh, the plumbing organizations. We meet regularly with the architects, the engineers, uh, the Building Trade Employers Association, uh, as well as through our stakeholder-driven code revision process there, we think is really the best place for code revision changes that can impact multiple stakeholders and also to make sure that we have parity across the board. Uh, as we mentioned here, we had over 650 members uh, donate tens of thousands of hours of their time uh, to make sure that we have you know, the best regulations that really make sure that we're uh, getting the most bang for our buck for everybody's limited resources uh, and making sure that we're both building safely and living safely. I think the, the this is an area where I think New York City really does take the lead. We have uh, a very strong uh, support from our stakeholder uh, engagement, and I think that the process in, in and of itself is why that uh, many of them keep coming back because they do feel like they all collectively have a say and they get to see the inner workings of how was a decision made, and it does help to make a better product. Um, when there was the licensing board, were those individuals, the individual members, were they volunteer? They were volunteer, yes. They were volunteer. Um, do you, does, does DOB, to the extent that you can quantify, um, are you meeting with these industry professionals and, and representatives as frequently without the board as you were with the board? Uh, I think so. I believe we are meeting at least quarterly with these organizations, but we can check. These are not as formalized of a uh, 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 an appointment schedule because we don't have uh, specific applications docketed for review. This is more ongoing business. Uh, and then there are some more technical discussions with the plumbers, for instance, that, that occur outside of these larger meetings. Because I'm, of course, hearing that there aren't the opportunities for engagement that there used to be. Right. Um, has has the department heard this feedback from other other trades uh, that are wanting to or, or not wanting to see their licensing boards um, go away? Um, I think for from you'll hear probably soon. I think from uh, folks regarding uh, the electrical, but uh, for the most part, I believe that the the process is more transparent without the board. It's it's something that we can provide. Uh, clear direction as to how how or why we made our decision uh, on the the process we you know there are those who would like the, the board to remain but 
Uh, I think overall we have not heard complaints on the on the reverse end, and uh, since 2022 that we have not had the plumbing board, we have not had any issues that I'm aware of. Second. Okay, thank you. Um, with respect to the seizure of vehicles, understanding that you that the department prefers to handle this in a codes process, um, can you share information on how often DOB seizes vehicles or tools that are used in connection with unlicensed or unregistered activity at a work site? Uh, yes, I believe it is a more, it is a, a kind of a limited process. Uh, I believe it's limited to one to th uh, the construction of one to three family homes where there's unlicensed activity in connection with uh, the construction of new one to three family homes. So it's a quite a limited universe of uh, where it applies. Uh, yes, yeah, seizure and forfeiture tools, connection, unlicensed construction work at the site of a new residential structure consisting of three dwelling units or less, excluding commercial manufacturing. Um, the, the language is kind of narrow and limiting and uh, there, there has been litigation uh, with other city agencies that did result in a hold on uh, most other agencies, including DOB in utilizing this. So, um, and unlicensed work generally doesn't occur at new one to three family homes. I think the idea being that you're probably connecting uh, for instance, uh, plumbing service to one or more utility entities, uh, and in order to do that, you need a legitimate permit. You can't get uh, an unlicensed activity there. The unlicensed activity is more likely an alteration to an existing building where less, uh, uh, less interaction with other governmental entities is, ne is needed. But you don't, you don't have does the department not do seizures today? Uh, it has been limited. I don't know when the last time was we, we've done a seizure. I can, we can get back to you on that. Do you, is it your perspective at this time that that would strengthen the department's ability to enforce? I believe so, yes. I think definitely, you know, the, the ability to seize tools would be something we'd, rec you know, we'd uh, look, look to something to expand to include all unlicensed, possibly unpermitted, both new and existing buildings and uh, multiple building types beyond just one to three residential. Okay, thank you. Um, two more questions. These are actually for, for HPD. Um, Deputy Commissioner, just noting that the most recent mayor's management reports shows a continued increase in heat violations year after year from 6,211 violations in fiscal 23 to 9,204 issued in uh, FY24. Can you just uh, broadly share your perspective on what is causing the, the increase in the number of heat violations while we're trending upward? Thank you, council member. Um, again, in, the, in looking at this, because there was also an increase in the previous fiscal year to 23, um, we believe that a lot of it is accounted for by an increase in staff and a quicker response time. Um, the mayor's management report will also show that we are responding more quickly, not just to heat, but to all types of complaints. Um, uh, so that may account for some, certainly some of the increase. So it's your fault. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I take the blame, I guess. <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, uh, one of the other, which is very difficult to account for, is just the, the coldness of the heat season and the intensity of the coldness. So that's always very difficult for us to, to measure. Okay. Great. Okay. 
I will actually leave it at that. Um, thank you, thank you so much to the administration for your testimony today. Um, I look forward to continuing to discuss these two pieces of legislation and, you know, especially on, on 925, the, the mechanism, right? Um, how it, it doesn't sound like there have been many changes since the, uh, you know, these two terrible tragedies have happened. Um, and it sounds like despite how robust our protocols are for inspecting um, radiators and boilers and, and all, all sorts of systems, we don't do it within the homes. Um, and there's, there just is a, is a gap there that I look forward to discussing more. And on, on 429, uh, there were a lot of issues th that were raised by the department. I look forward to further testimony to understand uh, industry's perspective and continue the discussion. So thank you, thank you so much for your, your time th this morning. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just ask uh, that representatives remain to hear some of the testimony today. Um, and I will call up our first public panel in a moment. I'd like to acknowledge that we were joined by Councilmember Alex Aviles. We're just gonna take a few moments recess and we'll, we'll resume right after.
calling our hearing back to order. I'd like to acknowledge that we were joined by Councilmember Felice and Councilmember Dinowitz. So I will now open the hearing for public testimony. I remind members of the public that this is a formal government proceeding and that decorum shall be observed at all times. As such, members of the public shall remain silent at all times. The witness table is reserved for people who wish to testify. No video recording or photography is allowed from the witness table. Further, members of the public may not present audio or video recordings as testimony, but may submit transcripts of such recordings to the Sergeant at Arms for inclusion in the hearing record. If you wish to speak at today's hearing, please fill out an, an appearance card with the Sergeant at Arms and wait to be recognized. When recognized, you will have two minutes to speak on today's hearing topic of site of Intro 429 and Intro 925. If you have a written statement or additional written testimony you wish to submit for the record, please provide a copy of that testimony to the Sergeant at Arms. You may also email written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov within 72 hours of this hearing. Audio and video recordings will not be accepted. I will now call the first panel. Thank you. Uh, Bessie Kimfield, Alexander Karansky, and Ann Martinez. Now as, Ali, as Alex and Bessie make their way to their seats, I just wanna thank you for your advocacy, your incredible resilience. Uh, the, I can't imagine how painful this year has been and you have turned that pain and into purpose. Um, and here we are today hearing legislation because of your advocacy. Thank you for everything that you've been doing. Hi, my name is Bessie Kimmelfeld. I'm going to speak today on behalf of my son, Benjamin Karofsky, who passed away in January 19th, 2024. A total of three children have died from a steam radiator malfunction in their New York City apartment. Siley Ambrose, age one, Ibaneza Ambrose, age two, Benjamin Benjamin Zachariah, 11 months, just days away from celebrating his first year birthday party. The baby's deaths occurred inside of the apartment through no fault of the tenants occupying the residences. The deaths occurred from poor steam radiator maintenance. As of now, boilers are inspected on an annual basis. However, steam radiators are untouched and not even examined or looked at by anyone. A superintendent is often unqualified to determine any real underlying problem and often lacks the expertise needed to replace different essential parts of the radiator. New York City tenants deserve to live. No one, especially not a child or a baby, should die in the comfort of their own home from a steam radiator that is supposed to provide warmth throughout the cold winter months. If it was your own son, grandson, nephew, or best friend's child, or your own daughter, granddaughter, niece, and you got a call in the morning that they were found dead from a steam radiator in the home, would you take any steps to ensure this doesn't happen again? Would you say it was a freak accident and go about your day, or would you do something about it? Some bills require careful analysis to consider the pros and cons, but saving children's lives only has pros. If you see a father or mother holding their lifeless child in their arms in a movie, you cry. You feel the pain and despair in the parents' eyes and souls, but our life isn't a movie. Our lives, along with the Ambroses, are utterly destroyed, and no, no individual, regardless of rank, gets to dismiss the loss of human life as something that was merely a freak accident. Labeling the loss of a human life in this manner is insulting and degrading. This wasn't a drunk driver that lost control. Binyamin wasn't on the road at 80 miles an hour with his family. He was in the safest place in this world. He was in his own home, in his own bed, his ultimate safe space. It's because of the lack of necessary inspections that the safest place in the world turned into the most dangerous 
steaming the room to 212 degrees, as acknowledged by the FDNY fire marshal at the scene, saying it appears that the room reached a temperature of 212 to 215 degrees Fahrenheit. Not signing is a decision. Inaction is still an intentional act. Not doing the right thing is a conscientious, cons conscious decision that is made with intent. We boldly and truthfully say that if one is against approving a bill that is designed to prioritize the safety, the physical safety of New York City children, then they are choosing to dismiss the value of human life. Whether it's one life or one million lives, we've lost three to a steam radiator. How many more lives are you waiting on to be lost and taken before you decide that children are worth protecting? How many children need to die before the right laws are in place? Many often say that certain things are out of con their control, but here today it is in your control. You had the opportunity to listen to the Benzie bill, you heard the, the details, and now you understand its purpose is to prioritize human life. Its purpose is to protect children from experiencing the fate of three babies so far and the eternal nightmare that their families now have to live in for the rest of their lives. Where do you stand on the issue of human life? What decision will you make? Will you take passion and advocacy and use it in the most important way possible? Will you use your advocacy to destroy or to build? Will you use your ability to reject or approve? Will you use your ability today to ignore or acknowledge and vow change? What decision will you make today? Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing us an opportunity to speak. I'm really thankful to be here. Really thankful for a lot of council members, especially Purina and Sanchez, as well as Farrah Lewis and many others that have very bravely and graciously supported us. So thank you. Um, I also did want to say mainly just two things. One, the status quo is obviously an epic fail relying on tenants to report issues is a failure because three children have died. If the status quo would work, we would be with our baby boy in the park right now, not sitting with you here today. Clearly, the current system failed. And if we turn our head away and conveniently refer to it as a freak accident, that does nothing but further propagate future failures again, again, and again. So what are we gonna do to stop it? What action will we take to ensure that a fourth, a fifth, and a 10th child doesn't die? Human life and the physical safety and the preservation of it takes precedence above all technical laws. This is a human life law. This is a common sense law. It doesn't get any more important than human life. I was out of respect for everyone here, I was, to be quite frankly with you, appalled by the response of one of the members when they said that they want to, quote, educate tenants. I'm not sure what kind of education they are talking about, but giving someone a pamphlet, a piece of paper like this today, and saying, oh, maybe your baby might die, so read this, is not an effective solution. We don't want papers, we don't want pamphlets, no one is gonna digest, internalize, analyze, assess whatever information is on that little pamphlet. That pamphlet, everyone here knows, is gonna go straight to the garbage. We don't want pamphlets. We want legal, mandated laws to preserve and protect human life. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alex. Anne? Yes, hi. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Addie Martinez. Yes, my name is Annie Martinez. I'm president of Tenants Association from 720 Hunts Point, where the ambience, Ambrose lost their two little girls. It still it hurts. We're still fighting. And I'm here supporting Alexander and Bessie as well um, to see if they pass the Bill of um, Rights of um, the Radiator mandated. Um, I think it's not fair. There's still, we st there's no one to hear us. We've been fighting for years. There's a lot of things going on with these radiators. It's still, I'm working in our building. 
we having a lot of issues with it. An air dealer person just died from it and nothing has been done. I'm just here to support them and to see if you could pass the Bill of Rights. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Martinez. Um, Alex and, and Bessie, thank you, thank you again so much for everything that you've done to, to get us here into this moment. Um, can you tell us about Benjamin? When, when was he gonna turn one? Benjamin was 20 days away from turning one. According to the Jewish calendar, he was eight days away from turning one. Um, our, our family had already planned his entire birthday party. We had his birthday outfit that was picked out for him. We had a restaurant reserved for him. We had a guest list. We even made a budget as to how much we were gonna spend. Everything was clearly drawn out. We were just getting ready to celebrate our boy. We were getting ready to celebrate his first year birthday. Thank you. Benjamin was everything to us. Um, he woke up with a smile. He went to bed with a smile. Everything we did, we did it with joy because Benjamin brought us so much joy. Um, he was the happiest kid, took every moment um, and savored it in life. And, you know, even though he lived such a short life and he should really be here today, his quality of life was more than most people live in 120 years. So I just um, wanted to mention that. Yes, thank you. And as, as a mom of some, a baby that's not too far away from Benjamin's age, I, I just, again, extend my condolences and can't imagine the, the pain that you have. Um, I, I'm appreciating your, your reaction to some of the testimony that you heard from the agencies today. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed from when we lost the Ambrose uh, siblings. Nothing has changed since, since Benjamin. We rely on tenants making complaints. And as we heard today, 1,600 complaints in the city of New York. I, can, I would bet anyone in the world that that is not re representative or reflective of how many radiator issues there are in the city of New York. And so in, in, your, in, your, um, in your case, did you, con did you complain? Did you feel e educated or empowered to, to complain to the city and the agencies? So we didn't see any red flags, and that's really what concerns us the most. Had we seen excess steam, we would have definitely ran to the super, very likely call 311 because that was not the case for us. We, the radiator was not even making any like hissing sounds. I know that sometimes a lot of people that live in these old units, they complain that the radiator makes like this loud like banging sound, um, which I believe that means you have to bleed it. There's like a whole process to it. So we actually did not even have to do that. Our, our radiator was not making any clanging sounds. Um, in fact, Bessie and I had spent thousands of dollars on renovating our apartment, making sure that it was habitable, making sure that it was safe. And we did everything within our power to make sure that it was a safe, happy, joyous, positive space. We never thought that this was possible. We didn't hear about the Ambroses until our tragedy. And now we're partnering with them today to demand change. Um, we, we did not know that there was anything wrong. We would have never left our baby boy in that room if we thought that there was any issue. I think that is ultimately the most frightening part. The goal is not to frighten anyone, but the goal is to raise awareness. And in this case, we don't know enough about radiators. And unless you're a licensed plumber, you won't recognize if there's an issue with the pipes, with the valve, with the nipple connecting everything, you won't recognize that there's an issue unless it's inspected. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to add that there were issues with the radiator in the past, um, but those issues were repaired um, by the super. And clearly, even though the issue was repaired several years ago and there were no, there were no red flags for a few years, um, if it, if a radiator would have been, if the radiator would have been inspected and there would have been a manda mandatory annual inspection in the last year, whatever issue was not noticeable but still clearly there would have been found and the tragedy would have been prevented. 
So a superintendent is not a qualified licensed plumber, and it's really important that part of this bill being passed that there is a qualified licensed plumber who understands radiators, who understands the severity and mechanics of it would be able to be the one to determine how safe the radiator is. And I don't wanna take up too much of anyone's time, but I, I will also say that depending on someone to make that complaint doesn't always work. A lot of people might not speak English, they might not feel comfortable. A lot of people are afraid of what their landlord will do if he finds out, because he will. Everyone knows that if you call 311, they log your complaint and they log your address. The landlord knows exactly who made that call. And that's fine, but no one wants to get on their landlord's bad side. So clearly we cannot depend on tenants always responding and always reporting every problem, especially when it's not a real law. When, when the landlord is not required to do something, he won't do it. And, and one more question uh, for me, and if my colleagues have questions, please let me know. Um, what, what is your understanding today of what happened with the radiator? Has, did the fire department or the buildings department or anyone tell you what was wrong with the radiator? We've had to do a lot of our own research. We've had to reach out to the FDNY fire marshal. Um, we've reached out to the chief inspector, I believe. And we've been doing a lot of hard work trying to figure out what exactly went wrong. But we do know that it was a complete malfunction that, that did not give off any prior red flags. And we, we also have spoken to two different master plumbers that told us that if it would have been inspected, that they would have noticed an issue with the pipes and the valve. So this was a 1,000% preventable incident. Thank you, thank you so much. Is there anything that, that you wanna add? Or Ms. Ann, on behalf of uh, the tenants I'm just talking in, in behalf of all the tenants. Your mic. Oh, sorry. I'm talking in behalf of all the tenants. It's, um, we've been planning for years. All commissioners, councils, they've been in our building. Nothing has been done. These landlords, I don't know what they're doing. The building is falling apart in our building. I ain't even scared of my building. Where I live, it's going to collapse any time. We have been doing so many. 311 calls, nothing has been done. And we just, we really want accountability. We want landlords to be held accountable for maintaining their apartments. Um, tenants are scared, um, but not necessarily always able to make the right complaints to the right people, and not the right people aren't hearing the issues properly and making the proper changes. So we just want landlords to be held accountable. We really want active change and real change to be made here. And we really um, would like to see that radiators are annually inspected and that people's lives and babies' lives are saved um, as a result of, you know, make Benjamin's death not something in vain, but, um, you know, saving people's lives would really make it more meaningful. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Alex and Bessie. I, I want to turn it over to Councilmember Dinowitz, and then we'll, we'll come back to it. Okay. Uh, just simply wanted to say th thank you. I don't, I don't know how many people there are in this city who can not only lose their child, their, their joy, their, their life, but try to make life better for those that uh, come after them. And so, you know, I thank you f for, you know, a time you should be mourning instead doing work so other families don't face the same fate as yours. Um, I, w I would add, I think HPD's testimony is egregious because it's, it's the same sort of response that we have every time there's a tragedy, that we have the tools in place. Clearly, we don't. They are reactive to problems, but as you correctly pointed out, you're not an expert in steam radiators, just like we're, you know, so many people are not an expert on building codes, and yet, HPD seems to continually rely only on a complaint-based uh, 
method of going in and inspecting. And I, I, I just have to say how, how sick I am of, 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 of the agency relying on you, uh, on you to know everything when, when they should be creating systems to, to go in and proactively check apartments and units and buildings to prevent these tragedies from happening. Like you, you, sh you, you, shouldn't, like you shouldn't be here. You know, like you should, this is not <laughs> where you should be today. You should be at the library with, 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 with your son. You should be uh, tending to daycare. Th there are a million other things you should be doing. And being here is not one of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Dinowitz. Agreed. Yes. Agreed. Anne? Yes, I just wanted to finish saying something. Make sure, you're, make sure it's on. It's really hard to hear you. Hi. And bring it close to you. Oh, hello? Now? Okay. I just want to say my last thing. I'm a mother and a grandmother of nine. And it hurts me so bad that I even went to Eric Adams. I don't know if I have to say this. And he spoke with me um, saying that he was going to help to do these issues. Nothing has been done. He sent the commission. Nothing has been done at all. I decided to come here to see if somebody could hear us because this has to be stopped. You know, we have kids. It's a lot of kids going through a lot of dangers in this building. Nothing has been done. Yeah. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Anne. Yep, it, it's been eight years since, since the tragedy with the Ambrose siblings. So we'll definitely be following up with you. Thank you for coming here today, and thank you for, for testifying and for representing that horrible tragedy as well. Thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate you. Thank you, Uber. I'll now... I will now call up the second panel. Uh, folks will have three minutes on, on the clock. And we have uh, George Busolino from the Master Plumbers Council, Terrence O'Brien, Association of Contracting Plumbers, April McIver, the Plumbing Foundation, and John Sullivan from Plumbers Local One. And you may begin as soon as you're ready. You may begin when ready. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so my name is April McIver. I'm the executive director of the Plumbing Foundation, a nonprofit trade association representing both large and small union and non-union licensed master plumbers, engineers, manufacturers, and supply houses. Um, first, I, I just want to give my sincere condolences to the families uh, affected by the, the faulty radiators I spoke today. Um, given our limited time, my focus uh, in my oral testimony is going to be on the Local Law 152 revisions uh, in Intro 429. Uh, I did submit written testimony uh, in support of, of all the provisions in the bill. Uh, thank you, Chair Sanchez and all the co-sponsors for your support on this legislation. Um, and I also wanted to mention that the Local Law 152 changes um, that are part of 429, we actually worked with the department at length, so I was surprised to hear uh, some of their, their comments today. Uh, I'd like to highlight a few points uh, in response to those comments. Um, first, the bill clarifies and streamlines the process for owners to obtain certification of no gas piping, or if their building gas pipe uh, has piping certification, uh, it is not being supplied with gas. And I think you, you were kind of asking the right questions there, but they weren't really explaining. So we worked closely with Con Edison and National Grid as part of a, an industry-wide gas working group um, and this process to get a utility letter is not something they wanted to do. I do believe they are forced to do it, but the provisions in this bill would make that process a lot easier. 
Uh, in addition, I wanted to clarify uh, the five-year experience requirement. I, again, I think you were <laughs> trying to make that connection for them. Um, but of course, uh, in DOB rule, they actually uh, instituted a five-year requirement. So having a five-year journeyman uh, card requirement in the law makes the most sense to comply with their own rule. Um, and I'd also like to clarify the scope of the inspection. Uh, it, what this bill does is actually allows com commercial tenant spaces to be inspected. Uh, as of right now, it could be restaurants, daycares, those are considered tenant spaces. So what the revisions actually do is make it clear that it's a residential dwelling spaces that, uh, that are not part of the inspection. It's not actually being expanded to go into those residential tenant spaces. It seems maybe the department was under, under some sort of um, confusion. And, um, you know, lastly, I just wanted to mention regarding the, the code revision process. You know, we, we are part of the code revision process. I appreciate the opportunity, um, but when it comes down to it, the department has the ultimate say in what gets sent to the city council. A lot of our proposals get rejected. Um, and uh, as you know, that process is very lengthy, including the existing building code, which we were told supposed to be done a while ago and it still hasn't been sent. So we urge the council to pass this legislation, given that the cycle for local law in 52 begins January 1, the next cycle. I think I'm good. I tried to get under the minutes there. Excellent, thank you so much, thank you. You can do rock, paper, scissors if you like. Rock, paper, scissors to de determine who's next. Rochambeau all day. Uh, good morning still technically, uh, Chairman, Chairwoman Sanchez, uh, Councilman Dinowitz. Uh, my name is Terry O'Brien. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Association of Contracting Plumbers, City of New York. We are the oldest established uh, group of our, of our type, around since 1881. Uh, the ACP is a union-affiliated contractor organization employing thousands of plumbers, Local 1 members, installing new plumbing systems as well as servicing all types of buildings throughout the five boroughs, residential, commercial, institutional work. Uh, work. The ACP is wholeheartedly in support of Intro 429. Uh, 429 is a wide-ranging bill uh, with a positive impact on the construction industry as a whole. This is, like I said before, a, uh, as a whole, union and non-union alike will benefit and strengthen public's uh, transparency. Um, I have written testimony I will submit for the record as well uh, in conjunction with the Plumbing Foundation uh, as well as stakeholders here. We've been working on this for quite a period of time. I'm taken back a little bit by the, the department's uh, stance on almost everything that they alluded to on 429, but due to time constraints, I'm gonna limit my discussion on two uh, primary functions. The reestablishment of the licensing board uh, the licensing board, uh, DOB glossed over what was previously done, it's two components. The review of new applicants, which they are saying there are limitations of public involvement, which is, uh, I think, uh, asinine to a degree because uh, with this day and age, we have learned during COVID, we had those meetings uh, going on still. Uh, it didn't slow the process up. They just don't like oversight, and much like many city agencies, they don't like oversight. But the more daunting thing is the city uh, licensing board would review disciplinary matters of uh, current holders. And uh, the DOB would be uh, remiss not to say that most tips that come on license work and unlicensed work by license holders and uh, um, people who don't have um, li uh, qual power qualifications come from industry as a whole. So they come from people on this uh, panel right here. So having our involvement only kind of reassures that third parties are involved. So they want our advisement to get there, but not disciplinary matters or licensing review. Um, other professions have peer review. Uh, as they said, they're kind of pushing out the electricians. The electricians have a board. They're doing away with that as well because it's in their power. The, the power that is here today is reestablishing that for more view by the public. Regarding the seizure ability, I think DOB said Conceptually, they're in favor, considering uh, over years of discussion on it, they've been actually asking for this, but they want it done through the uh, code revision process, which takes a long period of time. I think in this day and age, because of the prevalency of unlicensed work, uh, the ability to do uh, seizure of tools and vehicles, because most of it, as uh, Deputy Commissioner mentioned, uh, was, is limited to new construction. Uh, I think having that uh, expansion for all types of work uh, is necessary. 
and I am running out of time, but my written statements kind of summarize everything we said here, and we can gladly answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, I'm John Sullivan. I'm a full-time instructor uh, for the Plumbers Local One Trade Education Fund. So thank you, Chair Sanchez and the members of City Council on Housing and Buildings for support for, uh, for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, before I start, it would be remiss not to say, to express my sincere condolences to the families affected by the tragedies talked about in the other proposal today. I'm sure that um, the council will come up with a wise solution to these, to these issues. Um, however, I'm here today as a representative of the local one to speak on my members' behalf in full support of Intro 429. Personally, I've been in the plumbing industry in New York City for more than 25 years. Um, over the course of my career, I've been fortunate enough to sit on many codes and standards committees. Currently, I sit on the New York City Plumbing Code Technical Committee. It is with that perspective that I come here today urging support for Intro 429. I would like to quickly speak to the specifics of three items that comprise this law. Uh, the first item is section 28-105.4 of the Administrative Code of the City of New York, which addresses work categorized as emergency work and work categorized as ordinary plumbing work. In plain language, ordinary plumbing work covers plumbing work which requires a master plumber to perform the work but is allowed to be done without department issued permits or department inspection. The process is intended to streamline the paperwork and provides cost savings for property owners while still notifying the department and maintaining those highest levels of public safety. The second item I'd like to mention is Section 308 of the Administrative Code. Initially known as Local Law 152 of 2016, Article 318 has become a silent protector of our age and building stock. Local Law 152 was a great step forward in protecting our city from the repeating the horrific disasters which led to its passing and these updates to the Article 318 are a result of lessons learned since that initial passing. Intro 429 further solidifies the intent of 318 by placing a burden of proof on the inspection entity to prove the relevant training experience. Updates to Section 318 will advance protection of our building stock and our population by requiring the inspection entity to take action for certain AOCs categorized as immediately hazardous. The last item I want to talk about is amending the Administrative Code of the City of New York with new Article 417 boards, which is a reinstatement of the Plumbing and Fire Suppression Licensing Boards. Article 417 aims to protect the public by ensuring license holders have been thoroughly vetted by an unbiased cross section of registered and licensed professionals, ensuring new license holders are properly qualified in their trade. A licensing board ensures a proven application of checks and balances by utilizing the collective knowledge and experience of industry leaders who have worked with the jurisdiction of the New York City Ma Administrative Code for years. The representative membership identified by Article 417 ensures a fair and equitable administration of the board and aids the commissioner in performing their important work. Reinstatement of these strict advisory boards is an endorsement for safety, transparency, and egalitarianism in this administration. As a registered journeyman who has seen and understood the importance of the licensee's voice and code administration, I urge you to vote yes on intro 429, reinstating the Plumbing and Fire Suppression License Board, extending the scope of ordinary plumbing work, and clarifying the elements of periodic gas inspection. Uh, Chair, if you wouldn't mind, can you please allow me just for a little bit of latitude? Please. Okay. Um, I have a quick statement from my business manager, Paul O'Connor, in reference to something that was stated earlier. So the reference, the representative from DOB and Deputy Commissioner of Development and Technical Affairs stated that the DOB has met with industry leaders on an advisory level since the dissolution of the boards intended to be reinstated by this Article 429. No member of the DOB has ever met with any representative of the union to discuss ongoing issues they are seeing in, in this industry. However, the union is open to meet with them to discuss what we are seeing anytime. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. George Vassalino speaking on behalf of the Master Plumbers Council. And from the Master Plumbers Council, our heartfelt condolences to those parents. Um, I'm not familiar enough with Intro 925 to speak on it intelligently, but who could be against anything that provides public safety um, if it's effective? And what I can speak about today is the material that's in Intro 429, which includes cleanup provisions of existing codes 
and directly protects public safety. Ordinary plumbing work is an important tool available to tenants, owners, and licensed plumbers. It saves your constituents time and money by enabling licensed plumbers to safely perform ordinary plumbing work without permits or inspections. This negates incentives for owners to utilize unqualified persons, persons which poses a direct threat to public safety. This amendment clarifies the approved work scopes that are completed safely by their licensed plumber. The department, department receives reports for all work performed and may audit the work at their discretion. We're quickly approaching the 10th anniversary of the preventable East Village explosion. That crime was a driving force in 10 pieces of gas legislation. The compliance rate for safety inspections are low because many owners fear that existing gas systems may be shut down or they can incur thousands of dollars in repair costs. Extensions, outreach, and the threat of fines have failed to increase compliance during the first cycle. Fines are not a deterrent, and compliance will only increase when owners are comfortable with the process. As gas is phased out over the coming decades, less attention is going to be paid to maintenance of systems, and compliance will be essential to protect the public from a reoccurrence. While this amendment is written in very technical terms, it simply clarifies the current inspection process and terminology. There's nothing new. A key clarification eliminates the misconception that the council intended to exempt the same type of commercial tenant space where the Second Avenue crime occurred from being inspected again. Adoption of this amendment sends a clear message. Gas is only shut down in the case of an emergency, repairs are limited, and everything else is just simply put on a report. It's that simple. Besides allaying the concerns of owners, this will reduce overall compliance costs, not increase them. New York City is comprised of dense construction. In the Second Avenue incident, one building exploded, but three were ultimately destroyed. And one person's greed and selfish disregard for the law took innocent lives and displaced many others. Since I have a little time, I'm going to discuss a couple of other things. Emergency work. This is not an expansion. If you read the first line of emergency work, it says, may include but shall not be limited to. That means it's, there's no limitation. This is not an expansion. What that procedure was done was to allow me as a licensed plumber to go into your building and make an emergency repair. Now from the department's perspective, once the emergency is mitigated, okay, shut off the water, there's no leak. How does that help you? You need the water back on. You're required under the administrative code to maintain your building in good working condition. And that's basically what this says. Um, if I have another couple of seconds. As far as the fire suppression change, what it says, how can I do fire suppression work as a licensed plumber, and it's defined as plumbing work, and not be defined in, in the fire suppression section. That's all that is. It can't be in two things. As far as the gas, same thing. There's two definitions in the code where gas stops. Does it stop here, or does it stop here? Well, the code would go to the more restrictive one. And as far as the department incurring additional inspection costs, anything gas related is inspected now. So that's no extra burden. For the license board, I served on the license board for many years. It served a great purpose. It's advisory. If there was a problem, meetings were canceled. There was a lot of different reasons. Blame to go around. Simply remove the quorum. You could have a meeting. And if we're there, we're there. And if we're not, we're not. It was advisory only. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, maybe, maybe starting with you, George, but anyone who can speak to this. Um, Regarding the licensing board, were there examples, if you served on one or if you were familiar with, uh, with the proceedings, were there examples that you can share of the licensing board catching fraud or other misdeeds? Yes. So I've been the licensed plumber now for uh, over 40 years, and the process was much different. So what happens now is you get an application, you fill it out, you fill out, um, you send in all your stuff, and it's reviewed by the department. Let's call it a 10-point checklist. So. Once you hit all the boxes, you go to the board, and then you would go for review. So we would look at people, and every once in a while, very rare, we'd find an anomaly and bring people in for further questions. The importance of the board is that you have a licensed plumber, a licensed fire suppression contractor, with real-world experience that can look and see those anomalies. That was the advantage of it. And again, it's just advice. Can I'll go I, one step sorry. further. Oh, go sorry. Further. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just wanted to add, um, recently as the summer, uh, the person who's in charge of enforcement uh, said to us that the Plumbing Foundation gives a lot of tips on unlicensed plumbing, something we call cover-up plumbing, um, just general, you know, unlicensed construction activities. They said, you know, they are primarily 
complaint driven and most of the complaints come from our associations. So, I mean, these are the plumbers sitting on these associations and that's, you know, important for disciplinary actions. I'll have one further comment. The, George talked about the applications of new applicants. Uh, the, the review of activities of current license holders, the industry has reviewed them over the years and they would have taken a different tact. Uh, you have a, um, a finite amount of experience of people dealing with investigating license holders and peer review fills those gaps. And we're not talking about getting involved in the process. We're talking about before the commissioner signs a stipulation to bring it before blindly redacting information much the way it was intended and I've seen it in action over the years, been doing this for quite some time. Uh, that's what we're talking about. The, so the, the industry would say that's not severe enough. Did you look here? There were things that make this a lot more equitable and responsible for the city to do if they had involvement from the industry. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Very, very helpful testimony, and thank you for all of your advocacy on this bill. Okay, I'd now like to call Melissa Barbour from the Mechanical Contractors Association of New York, Oksana Miranova from CSS, and Barbara Manu. And you may begin whenever you're ready. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Melissa Barber. I'm with the Mechanical Contractors Association of New York. Our contractors um, employ local 638 steam fitters labor, performing heating, ventilation, air conditioning, fire sprinkler work, um, refrigeration throughout New York City. Um, I wanted to comment quickly on the two bills uh, regarding 925. We, um, while we're in favor of the legislation seeking to proactively reduce serious injury or death, we believe the legislation can be improved upon to, by expanding the scope of individuals who could perform these inspections. Um, we believe that the scope of a licensed master plumber is too narrow. A portion of heating and mechanical contractors happen to also be licensed master plumbers, but there's nothing about a licensed master plumber that signifies that they work on steam heating systems. New York City does not currently require a mechanical contractor license. However, there are a significant amount of local mechanical contractors that would also be qualified to perform that type of work. Um, as far as 429, I don't want to be repetitive to what the Plumbing Foundation said regarding the license board, but we also feel it served a really important purpose, and one of those purposes was to proactively talk about illegal and legal plumbing practices and fire suppression practices, and we feel that um, that was something unilaterally taken out of the code, and we would like to see that reinstated. Um, I differ from the testimony regarding uh, 429 regarding fire suppression piping work, that was the definition of fire suppression piping work was thoroughly vetted by the code committee. It was um, discussed multiple times and the code committee, DOB, and outside of the plumbing industry all felt that those are two distinct trades and with different qualifications and chose to leave that definition the way it was. So if that was going to be discussed again, I'd like to see it happen through the code process um, where it was originally discussed. Um, but that's it, those are my comments, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, just a clarifying question, Melissa. You said there, there are other professionals that would be qualified to conduct the reviews as uh, required in 925. Could you share who those are? Sure, I mean, um, the Mechanical Contractors Association, our contractors, so mechanical contracting is one of the, um, the steam fitting trade, we're not licensed by the Department of Building, so there's no mechanical contractor license. However, uh, the majority of our members perform uh, work on heating systems, and so that, um, you know, and have multiple years' experience, insurance, all of those uh, 
what I would consider someone qualified and very knowledgeable about steam heating. Uh, the oil burner license would also probably be those individuals. Uh, stationary engineers, there's, um, so I think there's a, a larger universe of people that are very well vetted to look at steam heating systems. Okay. Thank you, appreciate it. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Barbara Meno. I have. T I cannot hear you. Okay. I'm sorry. My name is Barbara Meno, and I have two disabled children. This is my fourth time coming to City Hall to uh, for a hearing. Um, we've been homeless since June 2018. I have a 26 year old mentally se severe mental, who has severe mental disease and also has type two. I also have a, my 18 year old with me here. Back in 2017, I know the first panel were talking about uh, the f um, heating hydrates. My problem in my old apartment was from the water. I have no idea my children were affected by lead. So right now, both of them have, you know, mental problems. So we have Section 8. I want to, I'm very overwhelmed of what I'm saying. So just, I apologize the way I'm talking. So back in 2017, the city told us to move out from the apartment because the landlord was not fixing the apartment. Every time they come for inspection, I would just, they would say, they would ask me to sign and they will come back later. So this, became uh, 2017, it became very bad in the apartment. I have no idea the gas was leaking. So before my son was born, 2006, he has been breathing gas, and right now he has breathing problems. So 2017, we have to move out from the apartment and go to a shelter. Ever since, from there, the city took our session eight away from us and gave it to my older son. So we have become homeless again from 2018. Currently, we are still homeless. My son has not attend any, has no education. After, uh, at the age of 13, he has not gone to school for five years because I have to move them around from state to state, continent to continent. Last year, I took, them, I took my children to my country for almost two years. We came back, but the city, um, the shelter re uh, refused us uh, shelter. They deny us shelter. So I moved them to Utah. We couldn't get shelter in Utah. And then we went to Florida. Still the same. We were, we were sleeping in the park, with the, one with the type two. So we came back this year, February of this year. D this shelter that we are cur currently living uh, there is in Brooklyn. And this is the fourth shelter. I was arrested also in the third shelter. Why? Because they said I am trespassing. Every two weeks, every two weeks or three weeks, we have to be moved to another shelter. So I'm pleading with you, and also our Section 8. When we went to California to seek shelter, I asked the city to move our Section 8 to, sec, I'm sorry, Section 8 to California, but it was never moved. As soon as we moved from the, the state, I got a letter from the shelter stating that the Section 8 is Barbara, terminated. Ms. Barbara, thank you. Um, we, we're at time, but um, your, your testimony is, I think it's better addressed individually. Uh, it's not in connection to the legislation that we're hearing today. Mm -hmm. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask my staff to connect with you individually to understand the details of your personal concern so that we can follow up with you, okay? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you so much for attending today. I am hoping we can be helpful to you. Thank you, Chair Sanchez, for holding this hearing. Uh, my name is Aksana Mironova, and I work with the Community Service Society of New York, and I'm here to testify in support of intros 429 and 925. City's engagement, uh, CSS's engagement with the health and safety of the city's housing stock goes back to our advocacy for the city's tenement laws in 1901 and 1919. Um, today, a substantial share of the city's 2.3 million tenant households continue to live in the same buildings that were built in the wake of those 
laws almost or more than 100 years ago. 83% of the city's apartments are, are in buildings that were built um, 50 years ago or more, while 16% are in buildings built before 1919. Some of these buildings have been subject to the whims of multiple negligent landlords for decades who have cut costs by deferring maintenance. At the same time, the city's proactive code enforcement capabilities have waned. The combination of these factors have resulted in unhealthy and unsafe living conditions for many. Um, for example, one in five New York households experienced heating breakdowns in 2023. Um, and households earning under 300% of the federal poverty line were more likely to be in that situation. Nearly one in four have experienced a heating breakdown. At the same time, uh, we know from the housing and vacancy survey that 38% of households have kept their windows open throughout um, most of the last winter. Um, this is an indication of aging and imprecise steam heating systems. Um, sometimes this type of deferred maintenance leads to tragedy, and I commend uh, Benjamin's uh, family's uh, advocacy for this bill um, and their partnership with the Ambrose family as well. Um, we at CSS compelled the city council to take action on both of these laws. Um, and in addition to that, since I have a little bit of time to go back to uh, the testimony of the agencies. Um, I completely echo um, Alex's critique of it. Um, focusing on tenant education is, in addition to the moral uh, problems with, with that stance, it's just, it's just bad policy. Um, assuming that tenants are gonna have the time to be able to uh, actively do code enforcement by themselves just doesn't make any sense. Um, and in my job I do um, a lot of review of uh, bills that come through the city council and uh, the, um, the administration's position that administrative burdens are uh, a hindrance to getting anything done is consistent across all sorts of legislation that CSS supports. Um, and it is just, it's bad cover um, and it doesn't make any sense uh, with this particular, with these particular bills or any of the other bills that um, forward the rights of tenants um, and make the building stock safer in New York City. Thank you, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, you answered my follow-up question, which is your reaction to HPD's uh, position on 925, so that is very helpful. Um, thank you, thank you, I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. We will now end with a Zoom panel. Uh, at the beginning of a Zoom, at the beginning of Zoom testimony, um, this is important to note. We will now. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I'd now like to call Brett Thomason. You may begin. Hello, and uh, thank you for allowing me to testify today. Um, I wanna reiterate a, a couple things that have been said. Um, first, I, I, wanna, um, I wanna start by uh, acknowledging the, um, the grief of the families that was going here today and, and their efforts to, to make a change at the city level. We, we appreciate that. And so dovetailing into that legislation, um, I just want to, um, I want to reiterate what my colleague, um, Melissa Barbara shared that we think that if the legislation is going to be effectively implemented, we need to widen the scope of folks that are, um, uh, able to inspect and do that work effectively. Um, I re represent steam fitters, local 638. We have approximately 9,000 members across the city in Long Island that um, are responsible for installing gas systems, steam systems, radiators, and servicing them. So um, we would like to see the legislation developed in a way that um, centers our membership and the experts that they are on those systems um, in those inspections. 
And then, um, again, a lot of what I was uh, going to say has been said both by the mechanical contractors and the, the plumbing um, professionals, but I want to reiterate the importance of the licensing board and push back on, on what the agency said in terms of their continued um, and ongoing meetings with industry professionals. Uh, I can say from Local 638's um, perspective, that has not been the case. Um, since the dissolution of that license board, our um, communication and ongoing um, liaising with DOB has, has been much more infrequent and the licensing board is, is just an important part of um, you know, showing the public some transparency and also giving DOB a tool um, to have some eyes and ears on the ground in the industry from, from industry professionals and experts. Um, so with that, I'll conclude my time. And again, thank you for, um, for providing this hearing today and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Brett, and, and thank you to Local 638 for your testimony. We'll definitely take that into consideration. Thank you. Okay, if we have inadvertently missed anyone that has registered to testify today um, or has yet to be called, please raise your hand on Zoom if you are testifying remotely and you will be called in order in the order that your hand has been raised. Uh, we have the following individuals pre-registered. Abdurrahman Diawara, D Dana Eldon, Marsha Ziegler, Fatumata Barry. If you are testifying here in person or on Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're in person, please come to the dais. Seeing no one come up, I'd like to thank the members of the public and the administration for testifying at this hearing today. And with that, I will call this hearing closed. <laughs>